Now uh, I will give the floor uh, to Ms. Nila Winkelmann. Uh, Dr. Winkelmann has worked for a Czech senator when I first met her. And that Czech senator took the initiative about the Prague Declaration. And the Prague Declaration is the foundation of the platform of European memory and conscience. And Ms. Winkelmann is now the director of, of, of the platform. I, I should also mention that, that Professor Landsberg is, is on the board of trustees of our platform as well. So, Ms. Winkelmann, you also got 15 minutes. And before you start speaking, I heard a telephone here now and then. I, I should remind everyone who does not know about my house rules. It's okay to have the telephones on. It's not okay to speak in them during the meeting. And it's okay to have them in silent. Everyone who has a telephone with a sound needs to buy me and everyone else a drink afterwards. Thank you, Joran. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to be able to stand here on the premises of the Lithuanian Parliament in Vilnius. I'm here for the first time, and I'm very pleased to be able to tell you a little bit about the work of the Platform of European Memory and Conscience and about our approach to achieving a united Europe with a united history. Uh, but to start with, I would like to spend a few moments thinking of the past in my own life. Tomorrow it's going to be a state holiday in the Czech Republic, the 17th of November. And maybe you remember in 1989, 23 years ago, there was a student demonstration that took place in Prague. Well, I was in it. And it was a demonstration to commemorate a victim of Nazism who was killed by the Nazis in 1939. That means 50 years before that. And as we gathered at this official demonstration, we decided we wanted more than just to commemorate a victim of Nazism from 1939. In the context of what was happening in Europe in those days, we decided we wanted to go and demonstrate in the center of Prague for freedom for the fall of the communist dictatorship and for human rights, for basic rights of a democratic society and the rule of law. And as we marched in the evening, it was freezing, uh, we got stopped near the center by the secret police, by riot police, by special units with dogs. And after one hour of a standoff, when nothing was happening, we got beaten up. I was lucky because some secret police officer picked me out of the crowd. He thought I was maybe not Czech. Maybe I was a diplomat daughter or something and there could be an international scandal. I wasn't beaten. He took me out and sent me home. But many of my friends got beaten up. So in those days, we were able to experience an absolutely thrilling thing, the fall of communism in Central and Eastern Europe. And for me, certainly, it was a very important moment in my life, some of the best experiences I've ever had in my life, to be able to be there, to strike at the university, to go out into the streets in the following days and demand the resignation of the Communist Party Politburo and free elections and the election of Václav Havel to the president of a free country. And in those months and weeks, um, this freedom returned back to all the post-communist countries of the former Soviet bloc. And as the Iron Curtain fell, one thing became clear. Throughout the years of dictatorship, all of us who had some uh, attachment to democratic values and who remembered, or whose families remembered freedom and democratic life before the Iron Curtain, we were all focused to the West. We were all looking westward and trying to get information. We were very glad if we could pick up West German radio or the BBC in the night frequencies on the very short wave radios. We were trying to get in forbidden literature. We were interested in what was going on in the West. But after the wall fell, it became clear that we could have anticipated it. The interest of the West for what was going on in the East was not the same. And certainly, the information barrier that existed through the Iron Curtain was really impermeable. And very few people in the West 
really cared about what happened in the communist bloc. Therefore, there is a lack of knowledge, lack of awareness, and we are still facing the, the legacy of this lack of awareness and lack of knowledge today. And that leads us to having to have a conference like this today where we are trying to reunite Europe, reunite the history, reunite the memory, because we do belong together. We are one European continent. Well, and so as the years went, each country on its own was trying to deal with the legacy of the communist regime. I heard here from Teresa Birute Burowskaite that the Czechs have forbidden the communists. Well, they have not. <laughs> it's not it didn't go as well as, as you think, but each country has tried to uh, deal with the communist stru power structures, with the um, establishment of democratic institutions and their proper functioning in their own ways. And we've worked like this for um, many years until we approached another important milestone, which was the accession of the post-communist countries into the European Union. This was another very important moment in our histories. And in 2004, we were all absolutely excited that we were accepted into the community of the democratic European states, despite all our post-communist problems, corruption, non-functioning institutions, etc. There was a large effort on the side of the European Union to impose upon us the rules of good governance, uh, the anti-corruption measures, um, the uh, principles of functioning of a legal state, of good administration, etc. And European values were very high in course in those days. And so for us it was a new state of awareness that we are now becoming part of a united democratic Europe. And as, as we found ourselves in the European Union, we, the post-communist countries, realized, well, at least those of us who work with issues of the past, realized that it would be very good to come together and to present our agenda in a common way to the broad European public, who was, as I said, not really aware of our issues, our troubled totalitarian history, and our experiences, and and problems that we have to cope with. Therefore, there was a suddenly a new possibility to, to work together on a European level, which we used. And as Joran has mentioned, in the year 2008, several very important policy makers met in Prague at a conference called European Conscience and Communism. Uh, President Václav Havel opened the conference. Um, Emanuele Zingeris was there, member of the Lithuanian Seimas, Joran Lindblad, very important members of the European Parliament, including Laszlo Tökes, who spoke to us from the screen. And at that occasion, this important document was drafted, which for the first time puts down a roadmap or a list of important steps that need to be taken in order for Europe to come to terms with communism. And this was, of course, the eve of the presidency of the European Union by the Czech Republic. And because of our enlightened leadership, um, the, prim, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister for, for, for European Affairs decided to call to Prague a working meeting of institutions and organizations from all EU member states dealing with the legacy of totalitarianism. And this meeting took place also in November of 2008, and there a working group on the platform of European memory and conscience was founded the platform being one of the demands of the Prague Declaration. And it was during the Czech presidency then that the European Parliament adopted the famous and already quoted resolution on European conscience and communism. And it is very important to know that this, this resolution was carried by all the democratic political groups in the European Parliament, including the socialist group. Uh, the vote was 553 votes to 44 to 33. It was a really overwhelming will of the democratically elected representatives of the citizens of Europe that we together work on coming to terms with the legacy of totalitarianism, meaning both the main dictatorships, Nazism and communism. And I would like to appeal to you who work with educating students to please use this declaration. It is very important to, st to stress that it's not a really political paper since it's carried by
by the broad majority of the democratically elected representatives of all citizens of the European Union. It is not a paper that would be working in partisan politics, that's what I mean to say. Well, and based on this uh, resolution of the European Parliament, the establishment of the platform was endorsed also by the Council of the Foreign Ministers of the European Union in 2009, and during the next Eastern European Presidency in 2011, which was Hungary, the Ministers of Justice endorsed the foundation of the platform, and in the second half of 2011, the Polish EU Presidency once again endorsed the foundation of the platform in what is called the Warsaw Declaration. And once again, I'd like to draw your attention to the Warsaw Declaration, which was adopted on the 23rd of August on the anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which was celebrated for the first time as an official EU commemoration event, because Poland had the EU presidency at that time. And the Warsaw Declaration, which bears the signatures of a number of ministers of justice of the European Union, states that there will be justice it will come, it will be improved, there will be justice for the perpetrators of the totalitarian crimes. It is a very positive uh, attitude that the EU justice ministers have repeatedly taken on this situation of the lack of justice after the fall of the communist regime. Well, and now this enables me to show you the first slide. This is the slide showing the founders of the platform of European memory and conscience after three years of work and garnering political support in the parliament and in the EU Council. The platform was established a year ago on the 14th of October 2011 in Prague under the auspices of Prime Minister Nechas. There's a little test, does anybody see him? He's over there. And the acting EU uh, president of the EU Council uh, Prime Minister Donald Tusk from Poland and Prime Minister Orban from Hungary. In this picture you can see representatives of the 20 founders, the 20 founding institutions from 13 EU member states and I believe... I cannot see Therese, are you there? Yeah, hidden in the, in the background? Okay. The group was too big to fit in a picture, so Teresa Birute Borowskaita is somewhere there. And you can see our host today, Ronaldo Sraczynskas, as well. So, um, the platform is one year old, and we had our first annual meeting last week in Berlin, and we are very proud to say that our numbers have almost doubled within one year. We now have 37 member institutions and organizations from 13 EU member states, the Ukraine, Moldova, and Canada. We are now an intercontinental platform. Okay, here just to explain what the goals of the platform are, there are two slides with text. But it's important to say we worked on the statute for basically two and a half years among our members. And we have come up with a formulation which is beyond any party politics. We are talking about restoring the importance of basic European human and, and democratic values. Um, the goals are to increase public awareness about European history and the crimes committed by totalitarian regimes, to encourage a European-wide discussion about common European values with the aim of promoting human dignity and human rights, to help prevent intolerance, extremism, anti-democratic movements, and the recurrence of any totalitarian rule in the future, to work toward creating a pan-European memorial for the victims of totalitarianism, to support all initiatives that give an equal treatment and indiscriminate treatment to all crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes, as well as to their victims, to work in education, developing training courses, teaching curricular programs and aids, because as we've heard today, as we all know, the history of, especially the history of communism is not really history. For many of us, it is still overlapping into the present for all the well-known reasons that you all have to cope with every day. Therefore, in history textbooks, there is a white space in the second half of the 20th century. We would like to help to close that gap. Um, we would like to contribute to a deepening the integration of European citizens, furthering the respect and understanding 
of the essential importance of democracy, human rights, European values, and the rule of law. These are all things that are not at all um, automatic for many of the societies in post-communist Europe, unfortunately, because after several generations, or three or four in Russia, five generations of no democracy at all, uh, it's very important to be able to work on re reinstating these fundamental principles. And of course, we are very much open to any cooperation at home and abroad with, uh, and across the oceans as well. I don't know if you see this well, but this is a photograph of a memorial to the victims of communism in Prague. We, this is our wreath which we laid after founding the platform last year. And only recently I started thinking about the meaning of this, of this memorial. Um, it actually has, a, for me, a very symbolic and important, important um, message which it brings. You can see there are figures coming down the stairs. And the figures that are on the top of the stairs are barely there. There are just little bits of the figures. And as they come down, you can start seeing more and more of the person until the person, the victim, is fully visible closest to you. And this, for me, symbolizes the fact that Many of the victims, or practically all of the victims of communism, were supposed to be exterminated from our memory. They were supposed to be destroyed and erased. I remember growing up in communism, I was a student in 1989, as I told you. We knew nothing about the crimes of the 1950s, of the time of Stalin, Stalin's crimes, even our Czech Stalin, whose name was Gottwald, and their crimes of the um, communists at that time. We were not supposed to know. Even in the families, people didn't talk about their parents or brothers or uncles who were killed, executed. It was a taboo subject. And so for us also, for all of us post-communist countries, we are rediscovering the memory. It's only coming to us now, in the recent years. We, are just, we have only been able to start gathering the recollections, the testimonies, to start speaking about all the horrible things that happened. Five after. minutes. Oh my goodness, 1989. I really have to hurry up. Okay, so um, I'd like to show you a few projects that we are working on so that you know. We basically uh, focus on awareness raising and education. How we can unite Europe and unite our history is by basically, we have defined two important priorities. First of all, we need to do the work. We need to go out there. We need to present what was happening here, preferably in English, in a language that everybody understands in Europe and um, make sure that most of the information comes as quickly as possible across to Western Europe because the people don't come to us and ask. And our second priority, which we define that is very important, is creating an international court. And it's been mentioned here already before, we find that after these 20 plus years of very limited justice in the individual countries, even for the most serious crimes, it is time to ask for justice on the international level and to ask for an international court. So we've had a conference on this subject in the European Parliament in June. We want to start a campaign for the International Court next year. We have established or have founded an international legal team of international legal experts who are helping us on this. And I will elaborate now uh, in a couple of slides on the awareness raising projects. What we are also doing is we are working closely with victims of totalitarianism. The, the victims themselves have started a declaration this year in which they ask for more justice internationally. There are 45 associations from nine countries who have joined this appeal for justice on an international level. There is a project which we are starting to work on, which uh, surveys the legal uh, coming to terms with the, with the uh, situation of victims. That means how well have they been treated, what, what did the compensation, restitution, uh, etc. Uh, look like in individual countries. And, um, we have, we have announced that we would work on a European Museum of Totalitarianism and we are preparing a conference for next year, which you will hear about more next year. But let me go uh, to the projects. Uh, we have, this year we have launched an international, international traveling exhibition called Totalitarianism in Europe. Um, it opened in Bratislava uh, in September. I've heard here that you have problems in getting names of perpetrators named, you have no pictures of the perpetrators. Well, we have put them in the exhibition for 12 participating countries. We have the faces, we have data about 
how many victims there were of the most serious crimes classified by international law, and what did the prosecution look like after the fall of the regime. And we have short documentary films going along the exhibition to show the real life stories of the victims. This is what the exhibition looks like. Uh, there are, for each country, there are two panels, one red one, one brown one. For each dictatorship, you can see the faces of the perpetrators, and there are statistics in the middle, and uh, there is an introductory text. This exhibition is meant for awareness raising and for stirring debate and discussion, because in some countries in Western Europe, it is not thinkable to compare communism and Nazism, even to put the data together and put them side by side. So we are doing it because for us, we are used to having double victims, and for us, it's, we, we went through both regimes. What we are now preparing as a next project, um, which is just in the making, is a reader for schools anywhere in Europe for secondary students, excuse me, for older secondary school students, um, anywhere in Europe. There will be stories in English, German, and French. Um, there will be life stories or episodes from lives of people who were affected by totalitarianism because how do you bring Europe together by increasing empathy and understanding and interest from people uh, who did not go through situations like, like us. Therefore, I just want to show you a few biographies that might or may not go into the book which are inspirational and which illustrate the importance of honoring basic democratic values there is, for example, a Czech politician, Milada Horáková, who was a very brave woman, a lawyer, who was active in the anti-Nazi resistance and was sentenced to death by the Nazis. She survived, as she was not sentenced to death, she was supposed to be, but she was sentenced to concentration camp imprisonment. She survived, and after the war, she was put on trial by the communists, and in a show trial with 13 other colleagues, she was executed. She was sentenced to death and executed on the gallows. There were four death sentences and um, nine lifetime and extremely long prison sentences in a completely fabricated trial. There is, for example, the case of the Czechoslovak uh, military men who, after Hitler occupied the country, all went to, to the West and fought with the Allied forces in the West. And when France was taken by Hitler, they went to Britain. And this is a fighter pilot from the Royal Air Force who was extremely brave and decorated. He was shot down in France uh, by the Germans. He was in, in German custody. He escaped a number of times as a very brave man, and he was wounded in the war, etc. When he was liberated at the end of the war, he came back home, and he continued military duty. When the communists took over, he was, of course, as an enemy of the state. He was sent into a communist concentration camp into uranium mines, and he was basically worked to death. He died of a very serious heart attack in 1957. There is another person now from Poland, an absolutely brave hero who could really serve as a European role model. Uh, he was a captain, Witold Pilecki. He was famous, uh, well, famous. He, he fought in the war of the Pol Pol Polish-Russian War in 1921. And uh, in the Second World War, he did an absolutely amazing thing. He volunteered to be closed or uh, imprisoned in Auschwitz. He actually took somebody's papers and with a fake identity, he was deported to Auschwitz, just to, to, to see what's going on there. This was in 1941. And as early as 1941, he was sending out reports on what was going on, on the extermination of the prisoners and the Jews. And he was, he was organizing resistance within the concentration camp. And not only did he do that, but he did another incredible feat. In 1943, he managed to escape from Auschwitz. He and a, and a colleague, they managed to get out. And he, he was to, he, the only reason was to increase awareness in the West about the atrocities of the Nazis. And he was actually an absolutely uh, honorable man with, with very high moral principles. And of course, as such, he became one of the first victims of the, or victims of the first years of communist regime. He was put on a show trial and executed for fabricated reasons. This is a clear example of the biographies of people in Europe who were touched by both totalitarian regimes for upholding democratic principles. And there is another picture here of another Polish young lady. She was only 17 when she was executed by the communists. Uh, she was a daughter of a family which was severely struck by the Second World War. Her mother was killed by the Gestapo. Her father died in the war. And she and two sisters 
joined the underground army in Poland, and she was a nurse. And uh, after the war, once again in 1946, the Polish communists thought that she was, uh, well, they fabricated again a trial against her, and she was ex executed by a firing squad in 1946. I mean, these stories all look depressive because all the people died. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't made a final selection yet, but we would like to show with these stories that it really pays to support uh, and it's very important to support and uphold basic values in Europe. Here is a list of all the members of the platform. As you can see, there are one or two, at least two organizations from each country. Uh, from Lithuania, we have our Genocide and Resistance Research Center and the Secretariat of the Commission with a very long name. Yeah, our members and uh, plenty of German organizations, by the way. We have the Federal Commissioner for the Stasi records, we have from Hungary the House of Terror Museum, we have in the platform very important state institutions as you can see. From Poland the Institute of National Remembrance, from Romania the Institute for the Investigation of Communist Crimes, etc. Et from the Ukraine there are also, there is even the Majlis of the Crimean Tatars, the deported pin, um, people from the Crimea. Okay, so I will stop here. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to, to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.